Good evening, my name is Gordon Vursic. I'm professor of political science at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, I teach uh, classes in American politics and I would like to introduce, uh, uh, it's my privilege actually to introduce a very distinguished guest tonight, Mr. Jamel Bui, who is uh, uh, chief political correspondent of the online Slate magazine and who is political contributor to CBS News. Welcome to this table. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, one of the things that my students often ask me in my American politics class uh, is what kind of um, news sources uh, they are supposed to follow, how do they distinguish be between what is true and what is not true, right. what is the political spin, uh, what is political opinion. Uh, how do they basically how do they basically can process the information political information they're receiving do you have any piece of advice for them I mean, my best advice would probably be to you know if you're if you're unsure which sources to trust you should start with the ones that are the most visible are the, the ones that have sort of the most credibility so i you know, i read the new york times and washington post I have subscriptions to both i read the wall street journal um, I read a couple other outlets, but I, I'm sort of a little traditional in my news mm -hmm. consumption. And generally, I think that the big mainstream papers do a pretty good job of covering politics, of covering the United States. Um, the same goes for the big networks. They're not perfect. They have their problems. They have their shortcomings. But those shortcomings typically aren't ideological. Typically, mm -hmm. they're more about sort of perspective or, or you know, sort of myopia um, about, you know, larger issues or sort of differences between candidates or that sort of thing. But when it comes to kind of just the communication of facts, um, I, I, I don't find that much to complain about, about mm -hmm. the mainstream sort of media outlets, uh -huh. um, which isn't a very, I feel like that's not a, the most uh, sort of sophisticated answer. Um, I think I've also talked to students about this sort of thing, and I think they want to hear some sort of heuristic or, or algorithm they could process in their mind for figuring out what to trust and what not to trust. But really, you just got to read a lot. And, okay. and get yeah. a, a wide number Multiple of Multiple different sources. Right. Mm -hmm. When I say to my students the New York Times and Washington Post are newspapers of records, they ask me what it is, and I say, well, that means that everything they say is true. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I would say that it means that the, the editorial uh, staff, the writers, uh, the editors, all work towards making sure that what they put in the paper every day is mm. as accurate and truthful as they can manage in mm. that given moment. So okay. That doesn't necessarily mean that every mm -hmm. single word in the paper is true, but I think it does mean that at least in the news section, mm -hmm. there are, there's a good faith effort to make sure that they're communicating um, mm -hmm. the, the truth of what's happening in the world. Okay. Uh, in my political science career, I have studied postmodernism a lot. And one of the main tenets of postmodernism is that uh, the so-called reality is created right. rather than given outright. Um, I'm also fascinated um, by hearing journalists and other media people and even politicians about creating the narrative, right. right? We are creating the narrative. So how do you see the role of journalism? Is the role of journalism something that reports what is sort of objectively happening? Right. Or is the role of journalism creating uh, public opinion in terms of how people should think right. about what is happening? Well, I think the role of journalism is certainly to uncover, to report, to sort of present um, reality as best, as accurately as possible by asking questions, by taking documentation, by witnessing and then communicating that witnessing and corroborating that mm -hmm. witnessing. But of course, doing that by definition means that you are in the process of creating a narrative. That's um, right. And even if you are as scrupulous and accurate as you can be, simply the kinds of stories you choose to report, the kind of stories you choose to cover, that all ends up shaping um, a kind of narrative and influencing how the broader public understands the world around them. So I'm not quite sure if it's the role of journalists to shape narrative, but it's inevitable that in the course of doing journalism, you're going to be shaping a narrative. I tend to think that what journalists owe the public is sort of acting as a referee for what mm -hmm. self-interested or more self-interested self actors have to say. Journalists are self-interested. They are um, in particular, you know, for good reason, very focused on ma making sure that politicians and people with power are always 
always accessible to journalists. They're very concerned about journalistic access. Not as concerned, you know, about other, you know, liberal pluralistic values, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. journalists will get up in arms about a candidate who doesn't hold press conferences, but doesn't, they don't necessarily take that same um, self-interested and advocate, advocate-based view about, say, a candidate who is, um, you know, disparaging different groups of people. They, mm -hmm. that they can, they, that's reported more of a sort of, this is the thing that's happening. Um, but even given that, I think journalists are there to referee and to make sure that there's a, uh, a mutual, and that everyone can agree on a set of facts and truths about the world in which we live. And from there, you know, we engage in, in democratic deliberation. And I think that insofar that journalists um, are throughout, throughout time, but certainly now have failed, is because they've fallen short of that uh, aspiration. Mm -hmm. As a referee? As a referee. Yeah. So what gives the right journalists to be referees? Do they have a special knowledge, a special insight, special connections in right. the power of politics? What gives them the right to be referees? I mean, you know, in, a, in sort of a strictly almost tautological sense, they have the right to referees because uh, our, the, our system, the Constitution, gives people who call themselves journalists mm -hmm. um, the right to be the referee. It gives okay, privileges it's, journalists okay. as sort of a, as almost a protected class. Mm -hmm. um, in a less tautological sense, I think it is um, a combination of, you know, actual training. I mean, anyone can call themselves a journalist, but to actually do journalism is a, is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the public to accept us in that role requires credibility, and I think that, you know, you can see over the last 20 years the credibility of journalists has mm -hmm. declined. And I would say that I'm not so sure that's because of distinct journalistic failures, although there have been plenty of those. But I think that's a reflection of the fact that society has become more polarized, more balkanized, uh, and people are not evaluating news sources based off of whether they are true or not, or whether they're accurate or not, but whether or not they flatter particular biases or particular uh, perspectives. And that's, you know, when someone says New York Times is biased, I don't think they mean the New York mm -hmm. Times no, okay. is wrong. They, they, they mean the New York Times mm -hmm. doesn't seem to reflect reality as I see it. Okay. Yeah. When I was reading your text, I was really impressed how much data you use. And I was really impressed um, uh, that you're using um, sort of research of political scientists and the scholarly community as well. So I was, I'm wondering, how do you see yourself? Right. Do you see yourself as a, I would, I mean, if I didn't know who you were, if I was just sitting in my home in Croatia <laughs> and said, okay, well, and I was, if I was not steeped in a sort of American media and political environment, I would say that you're sort of public intellectual or essayist, right? So how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as journalist, public intellectual, essayist, combination thereof? Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'd refer to myself as a public intellectual because I feel like I've got to earn that title. <laughs> but I think I do see myself as a political essayist, um, as someone who brings journalistic and academic work and techniques to mm -hmm. um, the, the, I guess, the work of understanding and interpreting and analyzing politics. Um, I, I myself do see myself as operating in a, a mode of journalism. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that the broad category would be just opinion journalism, and I, I very much believe in maintaining sort of basic journalistic standards and always striving towards accuracy uh, and fairness, um, mm -hmm. even if, you know, I have plenty of readers. And I, and I typically, I mean, it's very obvious from my work that I'm, I'm writing from a left of center perspective, and I, mm -hmm. I do have readers who take that to mean that I am an advocate of sorts. Um, and so there are times when people get upset when I'm describing something as I see it, um, bringing what I think is the relevant data and history to bear on it, but it's not necessarily flattering or bolstering what um, some of my readers think I ought to be doing as a person on the left of center, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm okay with. That's, as I always tell them, my job is not actually to um, advocate for your beliefs or positions. It is to bring this perspective um, informed by history and social science uh, mm -hmm. to the world of current, current events and politics. And sometimes that, uh, that bolsters a left of center case, sometimes mm -hmm. it does not. Yeah, it's interesting that in, uh, even in economics, right, which is supposed to be the most rigorous of social sciences, right. and uh, my colleague, uh, colleagues in economics are always usually using the 
ideological framework. Right. And then from the ideological framework, they try to interpret the economic data. I tell, I tell them it should be the other way around. But <laughs> <laughs> they don't obviously listen to me. Uh, so I, what I noticed, and I read a lot of your stuff, and I heard you on television several times, but I noticed that the main topic of your work are racial relations. Is that fair to say? Is racial relations in the context of American politics? Right, right. I think that's, yeah. that's very much a big part of, um, of my area of analysis. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you're, it, in one of the texts you're saying that um, when... Uh, Professor Gates from Harvard University came back from China and he wanted to enter his house. Um, his door was jammed. Uh, he basically, he was held by somebody to enter the door. He was in the kitchen and then police officer came in and basically asked him to, for an ID. He showed an ID, but then the police officer, they, they had some kind of a verbal altercation. Right, the right. police officer left the house. Professor Gates went after him and he was arrested by the police officer, which uh, led to President Obama's reaction. In, in one in part of this reaction was that President Obama said that uh, Boston Police Department acted stupidly. Right. And that, that sort of changed the way in which the white people perceive uh, uh, President Obama. In another text, you say that uh, African Americans and other minorities in the United States are sort of wall of protection of liberalism, uh, that uh, Republicans are using the plantation theory, uh, which um, I was discussing today with my <laughs> students, right? Plantation theory basically to argue that Democrats or Democratic politicians actually keep African Americans and perhaps other minorities dependent on the government, dependent right. on the politics. So uh, how do you see uh, evolution, revolution, change, or the lack of change right. uh, or situation in a, a bit of, of racial relations in the era of Obama presidency? Yeah. How would you evaluate that? Did they change for the, did they change for the better? Did they change the worse? Remain the same? Or is change mark, much more complex? It goes in different directions. What's yeah. your view about that? I mean, I think my view tends toward that latter idea that change is complex and it goes in various directions and there's been progress and there's been regress and there's been mm -hmm. backlash and there's been forward movement. Um, I think in particular, what has been uh, sort of the unique part of the Obama presidency with regards to um, race and race rela relations is the degree to which, you know, far from inaugurating some kind of era where racism was less salient mm -hmm. for our politics, Obama, not even, this is, when I say Obama has done this, I don't mean that Obama literally has, like, advocated this or said this. I think mm -hmm. Obama, throughout his time in the White House, has been a voice of racial moderation um, time and time again. But Obama as a symbol has, I think, laid bare very stark racial divisions that continue to exist mm -hmm. in our country. And so on one end, you have um, uh, white Americans who have re reacted uh, to Obama's presidency by basically um, indulging in kind of white tribalism. And I think Donald Trump's campaign is very much evidence of this. Uh, on the other end, you have younger African Americans, other people of color, who basically have witnessed the distance between the Ob what Obama is supposed to represent, uh, a United States of actual and substantive equality for all of its citizens, mm -hmm. and the actual reality, which is the United States still riven by racial inequality and racial divisions and, and segregation. And so that, that, that distance has spurred um, new activism. And so Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. I think very much is a reaction in part to kind of the ways in which uh, young people of color have seen, have perceived the United States as falling short of what Obama is supposed to represent. Um, and that, those two things I think will be with us for, for some mm -hmm. time. And I think that will be Obama's contribution. I'll also add though that I think one thing Obama has been, um, the, in spite and despite of the events around him, is a passionate and you know, obviously the most prominent voice of a, of a sort of universalist patriotism that you don't see commonly. Mm -hmm. It's always been part of American um, political thought and political thinking and how Americans conceive their country, but hasn't been so forwardly advanced um, uh, by an American president for some time. And so mm -hmm. Obama's vision of American patriotism and vision of America is one that's you know, both, both universal, that includes 
uh, that in, that doesn't just include, but in some in some ways, is very reliant on the African American tradition and the African American experience. Mm-hmm. Um, includes uh, Americans of Hispanic descent, Asian descent, includes LGBT, includes sort of all the the various parts of the American public. But it's also very particularistic. It's very much rooted in particular American experiences mm-hmm. and particular American ideas. Um, and I think that you know, depending on how this election goes in a lot of ways, we'll see whether or not that becomes the, um, the mode for which Americans who lived through the Obama administration, who formed politically during the Obama administration, understand themselves uh, mm-hmm. in relation to their country. Oh, okay. All right. I always t- tell my students that uh, Obama tried to get out of the start, uh, some kind of racial stereotyping but propagating some kind of a globalist uh, view or globalist narrative in which people are not determined by the race, but people are determined by their humanity, right? right. Uh, we are all uh, human beings, and therefore, regardless of what background of the race we are, we always have uh, uh, this kind of quality about us. Do you think that he has been successful in that, or do you agree with me at all? Or? I, I guess I, th- I think there's some of that in Obama's mm-hmm. rhetoric, mm-hmm. but I think the thing that stands out more to me is I think there is... A very, uh, a very particularist mode in Obama's um, thinking about America and American identity. Uh, and so, you know, to a couple years ago, there was a big conversation about whether or not Obama thought America was exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the controversy was that Obama said, you know, well, America, there's American exceptionalism, but there's also British exceptionalism and Greek exceptionalism that everyone kind of views their own nations as being exceptional. Um, and I think Obama thinks that. I think Obama... Uh, I think I do think Obama is um, not prone to a certain kind of chauvinism that That's Americans right. can yeah. be prone to. But I also think that Obama does see America as exceptional in a, in a particular way, mm-hmm. and um, that is that Obama's notion of American exceptionalism isn't so much rooted in triumph and mm-hmm. look at what we, you know, look at the foes we beat, look at the buildings we built. Um, look at how we are a wealthy and powerful mm-hmm. nation, but much more in this idea that Americans, um, because America is, or, or the American identity is in some sense is an adopted identity, anyone can, be a, can become an American, um, that the thing that distinguishes Americans is their ability to forge and expand that identity mm-hmm. through, through struggle against uh, other aspects of American life um, that are that, that run counter to it. And so he always comes back to sort of the civil rights movement as kind of the apex of this idea mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you know um, a group of Americans very much rooted in the land and the place um, expanded what it meant to be an American through struggle, and then this this sort of dialectic of of struggle of, um, of pushing against injustice um, is the thing that makes America exceptional. That mm-hmm. that is the heart of America, and that is something yeah. in which all Americans can participate. Yeah, I mean, he said in Chicago after the election, he said right. this electing of African-American president would never be possible in any other country, right. unless obviously in Africa. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he meant obviously the elected minority president right. would not be, which is true. I mean, I imagine in Croatia, if, if Croatian president would be of Serbian origin, that would be a really big problems, problem for right. a bunch of Croatians. Um, uh, let's go to the big elephant in the room, Donald Trump. Yes. Right? <laughs> he, um, I personally, uh, he, was, he has been accused of bigotry, racism, um, misogyny, uh, and, um, sexism. Um, uh, as far as racism goes, uh, I perceive him more as a racial opportunist than a racist. Uh, how do you perceive right. Trump? Is he more a racial opportunist, a racist, or something else? And, um, I, I tend to take a very um, sort of uh, pragmatic view towards things, pragmatic in, like the, in mm-hmm. terms of the American philosophical tradition, not sort of mm-hmm. the, the, uh, the you know, narrow term, um, which just said that like, I don't think it matters if he's a racial opportunist or an actual racist. I think at some point mm-hmm. if the effect of what he's doing, if, if, the pract- if, what, we, if what we experience of, of, of Trump is a uh, racial antagonism, is a... Uh, uh, speaking to and playing to white racial tribalism and white mm-hmm. racial resentment and whatever you know whatever he is uh, ontologically like who cares doesn't mm-hmm. really matter okay um, and I do think that Donald Trump is a kind of embodiment of a deep-seated 
white racial resentment in response to sort of the, the changes in American society and American life mm-hmm. over the last 20 years or so. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of not, uh, it's, I don't think it's an accident that Trump came to political prominence not as an advocate for better trade deals, um, but as the foremost advocate for the idea that Barack Obama is not actually an American citizen and is, in fact, an illegitimate mm. president. I think that That's tells right. you something about the the root, the basis for Trump's um, political support. Yeah, I think uh, journalist Joy Reid from MSNBC said right. it well, that one of the biggest disturbing aspects of Bertorism was basically the fact that uh, actually uh, Trump tried to humiliate President Obama by right. saying, well, you have to bring this birth certificate to the white master, right? And right. that was this racial, uh, uh, even slavery tinge to that, that she, she opposed. Um, uh, a lot of, uh, I was, I'm really fascinated by uh, the fact that a lot of uh, uh, American presidential politics, especially during elections, is focused on character, on yeah. the character of the, of the candidates, right? Everybody's saying, well, we want to hear about the issues, but then they find issues boring to right. listen to. And uh, my theory is that most Americans have pretty good lives, so they can afford to have politics <laughs> as entertainment. <laughs> but um, uh, how do you see the issue of character? Why is the issue of character is so much important in American politics? It seems to me a little bit naive to think that uh, just, ne- just because somebody is necessarily a good person, that they're going to, good, they're going to do good things for the community that perhaps comes from the this traditional view of European or Western ethics in which other regardness is morally good. Is this why character is important yeah. or do you see some other aspects of that? I, mean, I think I think that's a part of it. I think that part of it is just the unusual role of the president, which is not just the head of government and the executive mm-hmm. laws, but okay. also the head of state mm-hmm. um, in sort of a, a Americans the presidency is, a, is an office very weighted with symbolism uh, and it has been since its first occupant. And I think, I think there are a lot of ways in which the presidency as an office does reflect who its first occupant was, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and George Washington, by virtue of being this, even in his own life, this almost mythic figure, invested the office with that, with those, with those uh, qualities. And so Americans, in a way, have always been looking for someone to kind of approximate those kind of qualities. So they're looking for someone who is, you know, who appears to be, you know, honest and brave and resolute and, and all, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is that, like, the, the men who have inhabited the office, you know, many of them have had those qualities, many of them have not. But they've all tried to project those qualities, even as their actual lives and their actual identities as political animals can be very different. And so my favorite mm-hmm. example is Abraham Lincoln, who mm-hmm. has basically become a secular saint for Americans. He That's represents right. sort of the, the, uh, the, the pinnacle of, of civic goodness. But the actual Abraham Lincoln was an extremely skilled and savvy and occasionally unscrupulous politician um, who became president, uh, in part because of his ability to manipulate and, and play the game better than anyone else could. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to see that as a virtue. I think that we want politicians to be very good at politics and that uh, that this is it's not the highest end, but if we want to actually achieve things, that we, you, need, you need to have good politicians, you need to have people who can, who can do this well. Um, but I, I think Americans in general don't like that idea. They don't like... Um, they don't like politics, even though America is suffused with politics, even though Americans can't really even conceive of governance without politics, but they still don't like it. It's sort of a, almost like a self-hate. Mm-hmm. How, how would you then uh, sort of uh, characterize the current uh, presidential candidates, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, on the spectrum of, uh, uh, Machiavelli called it virtuosity, but he doesn't mean the moral virtue, he means the level of skill of appearing to be moral. Right, right. <laughs> so how would you basically, uh, if, if one in one end is being politician, the other end is virtuous character, that is perhaps in American political mythology something that American voters think they want. Right. And so where would you put Donald Trump on that scale versus Hillary Clinton? Right. I would, it's interesting because Donald Trump 
and you ask voters about Donald Trump, and, and Donald, voters may think that Donald Trump is more honest and trustworthy than Hillary Clinton, but I don't think that's necessarily because they view him as honest and trustworthy, but more that he is he is uh, unabashed and um, uh, doesn't hide the fact that he is, in fact, not a particularly honest or trustworthy mm-hmm. person, right? That, like, his, his shamelessness is what makes him... Um, appear to be the lack of political correctness. Right, is right, right. <laughs> um, and I think I mean I, I will say I think this is tied in part to race. I mean the things on which Donald Trump is supposedly politically incorrect are basically um, ideas about uh, you know African Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans that are racist and that mm-hmm. aren't true, but they appeal to popular prejudices and popular bigotries, mm-hmm. and many people believe them to be true. And so him simply voicing them unvarnished. Um, gives him this patina of honesty because, well, you know, we just can't say these things in polite society, mm-hmm. even though they're true. They're not true, and that's why we don't say them in polite society. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that spectrum, I, Donald Trump, I think precisely because he has been so skillful at uh, convincing people that his um, his rhetoric is somehow not calculated and completely unvarnished, I think Donald Trump... Um, appears to, to many Americans to be quite authentic. And Hillary Clinton sort of has the reverse problem. That Hillary Clinton um, appears to many Americans to be completely inauthentic. And I think, I think just in, in the same way that the perceptions of Trump's honesty are mediated by race, I think perceptions of Clinton's honesty and authenticity are mediated by gender. That there mm-hmm. are, you know, there, there are very old ideas and stereotypes of ambitious women and women who are trying to achieve power. And Many of the sort of criticisms of Clinton are both, in some sense, you know, not they're not, it's not that they're they're wrong. Clinton is secretive. Clinton is very ambitious. Mm-hmm. Um, Clinton has uh, not like a woman should be, right? Right. right. So, so, so it's, it's, like, it's like it's like both these things are the case. That's right. But it's also true that the level of disdain attached to them seems to be quite gendered. Um, and mm-hmm. so it's hard. It's a bit hard with her to disentangle mm-hmm. what what is an actual judgment on what, on like Hillary Clinton, the, the real person, and what is sort of a reflection of very gendered fears and mm-hmm. ideas and stereotypes. Um, and I'm not I'm not entirely sure. But also on the spectrum, I'm not entirely sure where to put her. I think in a lot of ways, Hillary Clinton is a completely um, you know sui generis figure mm-hmm. in American mm-hmm. politics, American history. I don't really know. <laughs> where to like I can think of a lot of analogs and antecedents to Donald okay. Trump. Okay. George Wallace comes in mind immediately. Okay. Yeah. But I can't really think of anyone else like Hillary Clinton. Okay. Yeah. Uh so let's say uh Trump loses the election, Hillary Clinton becomes the president of the United States. Where does Trumpism go? I uh I I think it becomes part of the Republican Party um for for the for a while. And I say that because I think what's been made clear from this election is that the the Reaganite consensus mm-hmm. has basically fallen apart. Okay. Um, and fallen apart because it just is completely not unresponsive to today's problems. Um, more tax... Uh, working Americans don't really want more tax cuts. Mm-hmm. They don't want more foreign interventions. They aren't even all that interested in sort of mm-hmm. um, deep social conservatism. Uh, and there's a vacuum there. And Trump has filled that vacuum with explicit white tribalism that mm-hmm. um, you, if you identify with your racial, uh, your, your racial identity, um, may kind of forge that racial identity in opposition to people who seem to be like in imposition on the United States um, and, you know, restore your former greatness and glory as what was once the, you know, preeminent American the heron bulk of America, right? Mm-hmm. Um, precisely because there isn't necessarily a counterweight to that in the Republican mm-hmm. Party right now, I think it becomes, if not a dominant faction, then like a very large one, one that needs to be reckoned with. And whenever I talk about this, I always say to people, watch what the ambitious politicians are doing. Mm-hmm. Who are they Who are they criticizing? Who are they not criticizing? Mm-hmm. Who are they cozying up to? Who are they not cozying mm-hmm. up to? What, what rhetoric are they using? What rhetoric mm-hmm. are they not using? I think the behavior of ambitious politicians will give us a sense of what the power relations in the Republican Party look like post-Trump. Mm-hmm. But my my sense and my my fear, frankly, is that Trumpism, that you know, whatever stew of, of nationalism and prejudice and white tribalism 
um, is here to stay as a part of American politics. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting and valuable yeah. conversation. Thank, Thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay. So how do you like?